wonderful it is for us to have this opportunity to listen to a man of God, a man who loves the Word of God, a man whose life has been steeped in God's Word, a man hailing all the way from Nigeria, West Africa, having come to our shores as the ambassador to our Holy Father, Pope Francis. He has come to us with a wealth of love. He has come to us with a wealth of the Word of God, the Word that really engulfs and embodies his entire being. He serves us in this region as the apostolic nuncio, given to Trinidad and Tobago, Antigua and Barbuda, Barbados, Dominica, Jamaica, St. Kitts and Nevis, St. Vincent, the Grenadines, Guyana, St. Lucia, Grenada, Bahamas. He is our delegate. We give God thanks for him, and it is with tremendous excitement that we open ourselves to listen to the word of God as he shares with us that Jesus is the cornerstone, the cornerstone that is needed in the rebuilding of every family in this our nation. We welcome you, Your Excellency, and we pray God's anointing, God's Holy Spirit upon you. I wish to thank you all for this opportunity to share some reflection to you on this special occasion of the solemnity of the Blessed Trinity. What a day on which to talk about the family and to talk about rebuilding the family and with Jesus Christ as a cornerstone, I understand that the theme of the rally is taken from the book of Nehemiah, um, chapter 2, verse 18, um, about rebuilding the family. On that occasion, it was rebuilding the walls of the city of Jerusalem. But before I go into my theme, if you permit me, I'm going to talk um, very briefly about the person of Nehemiah. If you read the book of Nehemiah, the first chapter, where this man is presented to us, we know that he was a cup bearer to the patient king um, at Azexis. And while he was there, a brother of um, Nehemiah came from Jerusalem and gave him the news from his homeland, told him of the devastation and the sorry state in which Jerusalem had been left, and Nehemiah was sad. The following day, the king saw him, looked at his face, and detected his sadness, and asked him why he was sad. And Nehemiah told the king why he was sad. And the king asked him to make his request. And then Nehemiah requested to be given the authorization and the means to go and rebuild the city, especially the walls of the city of Jerusalem. Now, I want to talk to you about Nehemiah. This is a man who was close to the source of power and authority. He did not think of his personal pocket. He did not think of personal aggrandizement. He did not think of being selfish. He thought of his people. He thought of the common good of his people, the city of his people. How do we behave ourselves? How do we behave when we find ourselves in positions of power? How do we behave when we find ourselves close to the source of power and authority? Quite often, we become selfish, we become ruthless, 
we think only of ourselves, of our private pockets, how to enrich ourselves, gathering wealth that we may not even be able to um, spend ourselves in our lives, not even our children, not even our children's children will be able to exhaust. We don't think of others. So first thing, let us learn from this man, Nehemiah, use his position of authority for the common good. That's the first thing I, I, I note about him, notice about him. And then he must have been a competent person. He knew how to do his work. And he attracted the, um, the goodness, the favor um, of the king, the esteem of the king, so much so that his look of sadness drew the attention of the king. How do we do our own jobs? Are we those people that are so negative? Our presence um, drives away people. Our presence makes people uncomfortable. Or are we those people that when we look sad, those around us also try to know why we are looking sad? This was Nehemiah. The king at a success must have had a great appreciation, great regard for him. That's why he asked him why he was looking sad. And then, this is a very special thing I'm going to tell you now about Nehemiah. When the king asked him, now make your request. If you read Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 4, chapter 2, verse 4, you are going to find out that before he opened his mouth to make his request, we are told Nehemiah prayed to the Lord God. It was a split second. It was the twinkling of an eye. He didn't have any time to reflect before making his request to the king. But in that split second, we are told, he turned and prayed to God. Hey, my brothers and sisters, let us also learn to pray to God before we utter our requests or before we speak in public. You don't need to make a very loquacious oration. No, no. You just need to turn to God in your mind, a short prayer. Oh, Holy Spirit, grant me your inspiration. Oh, Holy Spirit, grant me your anointing. Lord Jesus, give me your light. God the Father, do not abandon me. Be with me. You say it in your mind before you open your mouth. This is something we learn from Nehemiah. And then, after having said that prayer in his mind, Nehemiah spoke to the king and said, grant me that I will go back to my home country and rebuild the walls of the city of Jerusalem. He received what he prayed for. God touched the mind, the heart of King Artaxerxes and he granted him not only the authority to go and rebuild Jerusalem, but also the authority of passage so that nobody would disturb him on the way. And also the company of military escort. And not only that, he also gave him the necessary means the wood, the materials, in order to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Why can't we learn from Nehemiah? One final thing about Nehemiah, to tell you the type of person he was, we have to go back to chapter one of Nehemiah. When Hen and I brought him the news of how 
Jerusalem had been left. We are told he fell into prayer and called out to God. We are told he made fasting and prayer and the prayer of repentance for his people, not just for himself. He did not go and start accusing and pouring out vituperations on the leaders that had destroyed the land. Of course, the leaders were at fault. They had their guilt. But he recognized that no one was really free of guilt. He prayed to God. He said, pardon us our sins. And then he said, verse 6, the last part of verse 6, he said, even I and my family, I and my family, we are not told that Nehemiah and his family participated actively in the destruction of Jerusalem. But he recognized that in the misfortune that befells a people, no one can really say, I have no part to play. If we know things are not working well in our society, yeah, it is good to point fingers. But please remember that the fault is of everybody. We all share in it. So we need to begin with a certain introspection, asking ourselves where I made a mistake. These are some little reflections I wanted to share with you about this interesting personality we call Nehemiah. He is an example for us, especially an example for those people who are in positions close to power, close to authority, not just the head of state, not just the head of government, but all the people in some position of power. Hey, if you're the head of a family, you are also in position of power. If you're the head of your factory, of your business, you are in position of power. If you're the head of your, um, your soccer team, if you're the head of your um, community group, if you're a community leader, you're in a position of power. Learn from Nehemiah's. Even if you are the class prefect of a school, of your class in the school, you are in a position of power. Learn from Nehemiah's. We begin with ourselves, and I assure you, the society is going to be a better place. And why do I talk about society? Now, the society is family. We are talking about rebuilding the family. And when we talk about rebuilding the family, we are talking about re rebuilding the society, we are talking about rebuilding the country, we are talking about rebuilding our church, we are talking about rebuilding our team, our group. Let's think of rebuilding. Because why am I saying that? Family is the fundamental fundamental nucleus of the society. It is from the family that you start getting the society, you start getting the church, and you start getting the nation. If the family is sick, I show you the nation is going to be sick. If the family is healthy, be sure that your society is going to be healthy. Your clubs are going to be healthy. So it is important to start thinking of the family, repairing the family. And why today this theme, on the day of the Blessed Trinity? Well, if you are going to build a house, you need to have a model and the model that you have 
for rebuilding the family is the model of the family of the blessed Trinity. It is a family com composed of different persons but united in one essence. Unity in diversity and diversity in unity. I wonder who gave this nation the name Trinity. I wonder whether we, they were thinking of the diversity in this nation between the people from India, from Africa, from the Caucasians, all, all the places. Here is the real melting pot, Trinidad. And it is good that it has got the name Trinity. It is a place where we have the unity in diversity and the diversity in unity. This is the wealth of this nation. This is the blessing of this nation. This is the biggest, the best, the dearest commodity that you have to sell to the world. And therefore you have to pro protect it. You have to conserve it. You have to nurture it. You have to try to embellish it the best you can. It is the thing that distinguishes you. The day you start missing that mark, you will become commonplace, like the others. But this is no other place than Trinidad. You are the Trinity. So let us try to live like the Trinity. And what are the distinguishing marks of the Trinity, the blessed Trinity? Three persons. The Father is not the Son. The Son is not the Spirit. The Father is the Father. The Son is the Son. The Spirit is a Spirit. There are three different persons. You have different peoples, different persons in this country called Trinidad. But Father, Son, and Spirit, they are not different essences. No, they are one essence, one God. Just as all of you, all the Trinidadians and the Tobagonians, different as you are, you are one people, one nation. That is what you have to learn from the Trinity on this day. I'm not only applying it to Trinidadians, it is also to the entire universe, entire humanity, um, because we have the code number, one, two, six. I hope you're going to remember it, that code number, one, two, six. The code number 126 refers to Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. And God said, let us make man in our image and likeness. Hey, how do you think God made man in his image and likeness? Do you think that God looks like me? Skin color, flat nose, um, a valley around the eyes? Or do you think that God looks like the other person? Don't mind those images of blonde haired and then blue eyed Caucasian. God looks like each and every one of us, not like one, not like the other. That is why we are made in his image and likeness. So where and how are we made in his image and likeness? Read that text again. He said, in God's image he made him, male and female he made them. So he made them, he made them. They are different, but they are one in God's image. So in spite of all our differences, we are made in God's image and likeness. Don't forget this. Let us not forget this. Because the time we begin to forget that that other person, oh, she had treated me badly, or he had treated me badly, he had destroyed my future, he is full of sin. But don't forget, he, she, is made in God's image and likeness. I always like to underline this fact. 
every human being, no exception, is made in God's image and likeness. Of course, with sin, with sin, we begin to blur that image. We don't remove it. It is like a glass that is in a room, and then when the room becomes unnecessarily or due to some reason becomes humid, that glass becomes covered. It does not mean that the glass is no longer there. It is still a glass, but it is a glass that, been co that has been covered with humidity. That is a work of sin. So don't strike the glass because it is still glass. You can clean that humidity and regain the glass. So rebuilding the family means going back to the original setting and regaining the original setting. I'm sure uh, I'm not very good in telephones, but I see that when your telephone is bad and things, or some people get to attack you your phone, one of the things they ask you to do is to reset. When you go to reset, they ask you, what do you want? Factory setting. You return to the original factory setting. That is what rebuilding the family means. Return the family to the original factory setting. And where is the factory? The factory is in the mind of God. God is the primordial architect, the primordial engineer that built the family. And if you try to rebuild the family without God, you are going to be wasting your enemy, energy. Just read Psalm 127, verse 1. says, unless the Lord builds the house, in vain do the builders labor. So if you want to rebuild your house, if you want to rebuild your family, go back to God. Go back to God. He is the person that built it. And ask him to give you the original plan, the original model, the factory setting, so that you will reset the family. And what was the original setting? Code number 126. In God's image and likeness, he made them. Male and female, he made them. Different, he made them. Now, actually, if talking about making man and woman different, let's look at how God created living things. Go back to Genesis chapter 1, verse 11. The time that God began creating living things, even the grass of the field that had life in them, we are told he created them each according to their species. That expression, each according to their species, we find it again when he began to make the birds of the air, when he began to make the fish of the sea. Look at verses 20 and 21, each according to their species. And then he comes to make the animals going around, animals on the earth. Chapter 1, verse 24, it goes again, each according to their species. Now, the Hebrew expression for according to their species is very interesting. It is the expression, le mi no, le mi na, or le mi nehem. Le min means according to their differences. Min means different from. So according to their differences, God made things, living things, living beings different. The differences among us are wished by God. Why? Because God is the greatest of artists. Every artist paints with shades of color. No artist produces a good work with a single color, without shades. So God made humanity and the things in the world with shades of colors. That's why we have differences. 
But these differences are not meant to bring conflict because God still wanted the unity. That's why he said he made us in his image and likeness. Different but united, one in his image. Let me bring this a bit home, further home, with regard to the human being. We are told he made man in his image and likeness. But then in chapter 2 of Genesis, we have some more detail on how he made man in his image and likeness. We have two accounts, or two, the same account, two texts about making. He made them male and female. So how does he make the male? Listen. Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. God took a piece of earth and he fashioned this piece of clay, this lump of clay. He fashioned it into a human being. And that is how he created Adam. And it breathed into him the breath of life. The word is he fashioned. Yatsar is a Greek word, the Hebrew word. Yatsar means to fashion as you fashion um, as a potter, making pot. And then he puts this man in the beautiful garden he created, verse 8, and he wanted this man to be happy. The man was not happy. So in verse 18, we read that God said, it is not good that he should be alone because he, he is not happy alone. So I want him to be, have somebody to stay around him. And so God created this presence to stay around man, to give him company. He created animals, living animals. And yet, Man gave the animals names, but these animals were not the company that man desired. God discovered, God found. He saw that the animals are not the help. The word is help. Ezer. He did not find help in these animals. And so God decided then to do something mysterious, something that only himself would know, not man. In verse 21, we are told he made man to fall into a deep sleep. And while man was asleep, he opened his side, he took out a rib, and he covered the place with flesh so that man would not know from where God took the rib. And from this rib, we are told, now look, listen to the word. God built, not fashioned, God from the rib he took from Adam, he built the woman. Your Bible translations are not going to translate built because that is going to be, many people will not understand. But the original Hebrew text says, God built, the verb is bana, which means to build, is the verb you use in building a house, in constructing a house. From the rib, God built the woman. So even in the creation of man and woman, God already brought a difference. When he created man, he uses, we find the verb yetzar, to form like a potter. But now he's going to create the woman, we find the verb bana, no longer yet, sir. He builds the woman. So they are different. But when man opens his eyes in verse 23 and finds this woman, what does he say? Oh, this at last is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. Now, what does that talk about? tell you? Bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh means we are one in spite of our difference, in spite of our difference, even though I'm fashioned and she is built, even though he is black, 
even though he's not black. Let's say, even though he is brown or dark skinned and I'm lighter skinned, even though he is red skinned and I'm yellow skinned, yet bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. I have not seen the bone of a man that is black. All the bones are white. If you cut the flesh of a Scandinavian living all his life under the snow in the snowy areas, his bone is going to be white. His flesh is going to be red. And then we go to Papua New Guinea. You get the aborigines. You cut his flesh open. His bone, bones are going to be white. His flesh is going to be red. You go to Africa. You go to the pygmies. The bones are going to be white. The flesh red. You go to India. You go to any part of the world you want. The same thing. So this expression of Genesis chapter 2, verse 23, is an expression that calls our attention to the unity that God wanted among us in spite of the differences that he brought into our creation. Why do we want to destroy the beauty, the beauty of the great artist, God himself, by focusing only on ourselves. Hey, let me tell you, that is a product of sin. It is a product of sin. When you focus only on yourself and see only yourself, you are going to see your nakedness, your emptiness, your nothingness. Look, in verse 25 of Genesis chapter 2, after God created them in his image and likeness, in their distinct differences and in unity, we are told the two of them were naked and they were not ashamed. So they were totally simple. They were simple. You know, when the interest came in with sin in chapter 3, the devil tempted them tempted Eve, and then through Eve also the man, and they ate, ate the fruit they were asked not to eat. We are told in verse 7, their eyes were opened. Huh. When you think that your eyes have opened, when you think that you are special beyond the others, that you know it all, that your eyes are open more, the others, more than the others, what do you do? You only see yourselves. You see that you're naked. And then you become self-exalting. You become haughty. The writer Shakespeare has a way of putting it. You remember the play of Shakespeare, Measure for Measure. Somewhere Shakespeare says, man, proud man, dressed in little brief authority, plays such fantastic tricks before the high heavens as make the angels weep. Man, proud man. That's what we are quite sometimes, dressed in little brief authority. Hey, that authority I have in my family, authority I have in my place of work, authority I have even in government, don't forget, dressed in little brief authority. It is going to go by someday. Bear in mind it is going to finish. Everything human goes by. So be careful. Man, proud man, says Shakespeare, dressed in little brief authority, plays such fantastic tricks before the high heavens as make the angels weep. Don't think nobody's watching you. The angels are watching you, and they are just weeping at the silliness, you know, the tomfoolery of what we do with the authority we think we have. And 
thinking of Shakespeare. Don't say I'm only quoting Shakespeare. I also quote for you the Bible. Take you back to the second Psalm, Psalm 2, precisely um, from verse 3 all the way to verse 5. Why this tumult among the, na among the nations, the murmuring among the peoples? They arise, the prince of the earth, the kings of the earth, princes plot against the Lord and is anointed. They say, come, let us take off their shoes. Take off their shoes. Uh, come, let us um, uh, wipe them away. And then we get this text from verse 3, which tells us, he who sits in the heavens laughs. This is the one that I like to refer to. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord is laughing them to scorn. Hey, he who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord is laughing them to scorn. Then, 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 verse 5, then he will speak in his anger. His rage will strike them with terror. His rage will strike them with terror. It is I who have set up my king on Zion, my holy mountain. Just bear in mind that person you are attacking in your family, that person you are attacking your place of work, you want to destroy. It is God that has put him there. It is I who have set up my king, my holy mountain. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord is laughing them to scorn. Then he will speak in his anger. His rage will strike them with terror. It is I who have set up my king on Zion, my holy mountain. So let us be careful when we begin to deal with other people and coming home to our families. We say that in our families, we have to rebuild a family. Why do you need to rebuild a family? The family is made up of stones because it is made up of persons. The text of my reflection about Jesus Christ as a cornerstone is from the first letter of Peter chapter 2, all the way from verse 1 to verse 10. But I just want to tell you the important verses. Verse 4, verse 5 tell us that each and every one of us, uh, we are all, each and every one of us is a living stone. Verse 5, we are living stones for that house. So we are the stones that make up the house, the building that we call the family. But unfortunately, Unfortunately, we are stones that are made different one from the other. So if you have a house and have the living stones, they may be beautiful. If there is none to hold them together, that house is not going to be strong. That is why you need a strong cornerstone that holds the structure together. That is why verse 6 of that letter of St. Peter Chapter 2, verse 6, tells us, and Jesus Christ is the cornerstone. So we are all living stones in the house. If you're in a family, you're a living stone. If you're the mother, you're a living stone. Your child is living stone. Husband, living stone. Then what holds you together? Because you're all different. It is Christ. If you bring in Christ, he is the cornerstone. Now, don't think you are being forced to bring in Christ. You might also decide to have other cornerstones. People choose. You could go and use your best musician as your cornerstone for your house. Hey, but remember, your best musician is mortal, is human, like you. So, when the strong storm comes, he may be swept away. 
you may decide to take your human idol as your cornerstone, but he or she is only human, fragile like you. So it is not a durable cornerstone. Jesus himself has told us who is the cornerstone, rejected by all the builders, builders, but God himself has chosen him as a cornerstone. You remember that um, parable of the talent, the parable of the talent that is, um, we find in the gospel according to Matthew chapter 21. Toward, uh, not the talent, of the tenants, the parable of the tenants. Towards the end of it, Jesus says, have you not read that the stone rejected by the builders has become the cornerstone? And the people listening to him knew he was referring to himself. So Jesus indirectly referred to himself as the cornerstone. This is in verse 42. Then in verse 44, he tells us the stone, this cornerstone is so strong, he is so reliable that if you go to hit yourself against it, you crush yourself. And if you're in such an animosity, a, a poor situation, that this cornerstone falls on you, it crushes you. It crushes you. So it is a cornerstone, certainly reliable, totally durable. This is the cornerstone, the reliability of Jesus as the cornerstone of our families. And not just cornerstone, he is also the fundament, he's also the foundation. He's the foundation, but of course he allows the apostles to represent him at the foundation. That is what we find in the letter of St. Paul to the Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 2 when he tells us about the followers of Christ. Verse 18, he tells us to become his followers. We receive the same spirit. And through the spirit, he said, we are no longer strangers or foreigners. We all become members of the same household. The same household. This is Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19. And then he says, this household has as his foundation the apostles. And then in verse 20, he tells us, and Jesus Christ himself, the apostles, the foundation stone, and Jesus Christ himself is the cornerstone. Is this my family? Is this my family? Having the apostles, the forefathers in the faith, as the foundation, the word of God, and Jesus himself standing there as a point of unity, as a point of support for the whole family. Jesus Christ, reliable cornerstone, reliable foundation. And Jesus himself spoke about the confession of Peter, of his identity as the foundation on which he would build his own church. You remember that encounter in Caesarea? Caesarea of Philippi, that is told in the gospel according to Matthew, chapter 16, when they arrive from verse 13, we read, they arrive in Caesarea Philippi, and then Jesus asks them, who do the people say the son of man is? And they say, some say he's um, um, Elijah and so on, one of the prophets. And then he says to them, and you, verse 15, you, who do you say I am? Verse 16, Peter says, you are the Christ of God. And Jesus says, hey, Simon, son of Jonah, this has not come to you from human flesh. It comes from my Father in heaven. And on this foundation, this foundation, Jesus Christ, son of God, this confession, I'm going to build my church. Do you have this confession in your family? Do you have this foundation in your family? Jesus Christ, Son of God. He is the foundation and he is also the cornerstone. If he's not, be careful. Your family 
may be on you know, slippery grounds, unstable grounds. Get Jesus as the foundation stone and as the cornerstone of your family. And how do you get Jesus? How do you get him? Well, I give you the secret. Talk about him. Talk about Jesus and talk with him in your family. I have always said this and I return to this. Jesus loves to hear people talk about him. He likes to have people talk with him in prayer. If you talk about Jesus, I assure you, Jesus is going to draw near and is going to be interested in the conversation. We have the example of the disciples on the way to emails. We have the text, Luke chapter 24, verses 13 to 35. We are told as they were going, they were talking about all these things about Jesus. Verse 14 and verse 15, Jesus in person, because he knew they were talking about him, Jesus in person draws close and begins to walk with them. Hey, my brothers and sisters, what are we waiting for? Begin it today in your family. Talk about Jesus with your children. Talk about Jesus with your children. Talk about Jesus with your husband, with your wife. Get together before you eat. Read a little passage of the Bible about Jesus. Talk about him. He is going to come to walk with your family. This is point one in rebuilding your family. Talk about Jesus and talk with Jesus. When Jesus comes, he asks you, what is this you're talking about? He draws you with some question, some challenges. You begin to ask, what is this happening to you? What is that? And these challenges, questions that come up, draw you into conversation with Jesus. And Jesus himself begins to, when you begin to talk with Jesus, I tell you, the coldness in your heart disappears because there is a warmth that creeps up in your heart from the word of Jesus, talking with Jesus. That is what the two disciples experienced later on. They said in verse 32, did not our hearts burn within us when he talked with us along the way? Talk with Jesus. You are going to remove that sadness from your family. You are going to remove that difficulty. You are going to remove that coldness that passivity from your family. Talk with Jesus. And I can tell you, that warmth is so strong, your family is going to become, your company with Jesus is going to become so interesting that you don't want him to go away. You don't want him to go. Verse 29, as he, Jesus pretended to go further, and they said to him, Stay with us. It is getting dark. Why do you not ask Jesus to stay on with you, with your family? Talk with him, talk about him, and ask him to stay with your family. And even when the two disciples went back to Jerusalem, they got to the community, and they were telling the experience. They were all talking about Jesus. Verse 36. We are told while they were talking about Jesus, Jesus himself appeared among them. Hey, talk about Jesus. Talk with Jesus. I tell you, if you talk about yourselves and you're not talking about Jesus, Jesus keeps mute. He does not intervene. Compare and contrast the experience of the apostles of Jesus, not disciples, apostles of Jesus. Go read. The gospel according to Mark, the gospel according to Mark, chapter, the gospel according to Mark, chapter 9. The first part of it, we have the transfiguration. After the transfiguration, as they come down from verse 14, we have the healing of the mad, the boy that was possessed. And then after that, we are told that Jesus 
who was going passing through Galilee, going with his disciples, and he was teaching them. This is from verse 30 to verse 32. And as he was teaching them, we are told in verse 32, they did not understand, and they did not ask him. You know what they did not understand? Jesus was telling, him, telling them about his suffering, death, and resurrection. They did not understand. They did not ask him. And they did not ask him. Why did they not understand? Well, you read verses 33 and 34. When they arrived in Capernaum and they went into the house and Jesus asked them, what were you talking about on the way? And all of them silent. Why? Because on the way, they were not talking about Jesus. They were talking about themselves. They were discussing in verse 34, we are told, they were saying who is the greatest among them. This is, among, this is the way we are. We are focused on ourselves, and so with that, Jesus will keep him away. So, if you want Jesus to draw near, then talk about Jesus. Talk with Jesus. Invite Jesus, and then the biggest of it all, biggest of it all, know how to share your bread with Jesus. Because we are told when Jesus entered with the two disciples of Emmaus, he took bread, he blessed it, he broke it and gave to them, and their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. In sharing your bread with Jesus, sharing your table with Jesus, you reach the maximum level of blessing for your family. Remember, Jesus wants to share with you. He tells us, Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, I am at the door and I'm knocking. If you open, I will come in and dine with you. Hey, my dear brothers and sisters, open your families to Jesus. He wishes to dine with you. He wishes to dine with us. Rebuild your family. Rebuild your family. Talk about Jesus. Talk with Jesus in prayer. Invite Jesus to your table. Invite him, share the table with Jesus at the Eucharist, the Mass. Share your table with Jesus in that poor man that is need, in need, that is charity. Show your table with Jesus. And through that sharing, you are going to recognize Christ in your family and in your neighbor. May this feast of the Blessed Trinity be also a true feast for the Trinity of your family, the Trinity of your society. And on this occasion, I wish to take the chance to wish this country that bears the name of the Blessed Trinity, an abundance of the blessings of the Blessed Trinity, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Peace be with you, and thank you very much. Your Excellency, you always thrill us with the word. You always leave us with a word that we need to memorize. And I know you love numbers. So we thank you for sharing with us this word that is taken from Peter. That Jesus is in fact the cornerstone. And we trust that as we continue our journey throughout this year. That all of us will seek to invite Jesus into our hearts and into our homes. So that our foundations built upon him will stand firm forever. Thank you, Your Excellency, for your word.